when one pursues Buddhist meditation, and the, mon- and the monastery I lived in was uh, had some claims to be in a meditating monastery. Uh, yeah, if you um, pursue Buddhist meditation in in an avowed manner for several hours a day, it, it achieves a quality which uh, is different. It is uh, like living uh, with your uh, with your back to a very deep ocean. And uh, that's kind of the best analogy that I can that I can put onto it. Uh, that uh, you have at your disposal an extraordinarily still pool of um, of understanding that uh, can be lost. It can be violated. It can be various other kinds of things. But at the same time, it really operates as a reservoir. Uh, a place to retreat to, and a place to continue to go to, which is uh, extraordinary and effervescent. And so that's what I would say is probably the most interesting part about Buddhist meditation. Now, the the Buddhist meditative activities, there are, there are literally thousands and thousands of different Buddhist meditative techniques, and I have not exhausted them by any stretch of imagination in terms of my scholarly study. But nonetheless, uh, most of them go to the purpose of addressing that particular thing. And, it, and at some point, all of the various tricky kind of meditative systems that you find, the rituals, the mantras, the other kinds of behavior, the visualizations, almost all forms of Buddhist meditation will see that these are um, techniques that are disposable in the final analysis. In the last analysis, you have a, a a, an address of undifferentiated cognition that is considered or defined in various kinds of ways, but nonetheless it does not require an, or rely upon uh, the various forms of meditative systems that are developed in order to deal with specific persons or specific cultures or specific ways of life or specific concerns within uh, the, the different domains and language backgrounds and cultural zones that Buddhism has gone into. And so I think that's the most interesting thing, how it is that we have human beings continually reassert a non-differentiated cognition to the point, and this is what's most interesting, there's a Zen statement that um, if anyone tells you fire is light, pay no attention. When two thieves meet, they need no introduction. They recognize each other without question. And in the Zen tradition, this means that if you uh, have achieved a level of understanding and you meet somebody else that has achieved a level of understanding, you have an immediate meeting of the mind, that you have immediate recognition. And I've seen this happen. Um, Buddhists who cannot communicate to each other from different language zones, entirely different cultures, will have this immediate recognition of each other as uh, as masters of Buddhist meditation and as having similar levels of of understanding and occasionally I've been honored to translate between these to a couple of these fellows and uh, this has been an extraordinary kind of observation that I have and so I think that kind of phenomenological recognition if you will uh, validates that for whatever it is the Buddhists are talking about, they seem to be on to something. They seem to have developed a, a specific movement of humanity in a distinctive direction that we haven't seen the end of. I think we've only seen the beginning of. And I think at some point uh, it will have surprising and uh, at this juncture unforeseeable consequences for us as a species.